Hi, good morning all, and welcome to the first IOSH Southwest Branch Group webinar on preparing for a safe return to work. Uh, my name is James. I am the new uh, Southwest Branch Chair, just taken over from uh, Mark Brown. So I would now like to introduce you to Adam and Jules, who will take it away. I believe Adam will be speaking first. Um, so welcome all and Adam and Judy, it is now over to you. Perfect. Right. Well, hello everyone. I'm just going to try and get my presentation shared. So we're ready to go. And then I will start. If I, there we go. We should now be able to see my screen and I'll, I'll start by introducing myself uh, and Judy and um, talk a little bit about what you can expect from the next sort of uh, 40 minutes or so of webinar. So um, my name's Adam Worth and I'm the training manager at um, SSG Training and Consultancy and I'm going to be co-presenting with um, Julie Hutt who's the operations director and uh, we sort of uh, volunteered we're also worth pointing out we're both IOSH um, branch committee members too and we sort of uh, thought we would deliver a session on preparing for a safe return to work uh, post COVID-19 or sort of during COVID-19 is probably more accurate um, and give you some sort of practical advice. And we're basing that practical advice on how we at SSG have sort of implemented our return to work. We've sort of decided to do that because looking at a lot of the guidance around, we've seen quite a lot of stuff that's relatively high level and provides sort of aspirational ideas without that sort of practical sort of idea of what we can actually do. So we've done our best to kind of try and provide just an overview because there's an awful lot of stuff that we could talk about. There's some awfully complicated topics. We've tried to give an overview um, on what we've done, how we've done it. So hopefully that will be of benefit to all of you as well. So the um, presentation is gonna sort of focus on um, facilitating a safe return to work. Uh, and we're gonna look at a sort of safe approach following those sort of um, sort of the sort of five key areas sort of shown on this slide. So I think firstly, I'm going to hand over to Julie and Julie's going to sort of talk us through this first section. Uh, just on a disclaimer before we start, I'm in charge, I'm sharing the screen and in charge of advancing the slides. So Jules is kind of relying on me to get this right. So I apologise if I uh, get my slide transition slightly wrong. But over to you, Jules. Hello Adam, thank you very much. Can you hear me everybody, is that okay? Yeah, I can hear you. So. Brilliant. Well, I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about how to facilitate a safe return to work as COVID-19 lockdown measures gradually ease off. This obviously presents various challenges and for, for many workplaces it's not going to be a straightforward process. It's going to be very difficult just to reopen, there's going to be a raft of policies, procedures, and working conditions that are going to need to be adjusted, adjusted. And consideration is also going to need to be given to the impact of COVID-19 on staff, mental health and well-being. That's especially important. So as Adam um, alluded to earlier, we're going to um, just run through some of the measures that we adopted. Um, we took a, a planned risk controlled approach. Uh, we base this on very strong leadership, a lot of team involvement and sound health and safety advice. Um, so how did we achieve this? Well, as Adam has already mentioned, we looked at the following five areas, similar to those identified on the IOSH website, which is essentially safe people, safe systems of work, uh, safe workplace, safe travel to and from work, and safe plant equipment and machinery. So if we start with uh, safe people first, As we all know, current government guidance recommends that workers who cannot work from home should travel to work if their workplace is open. However, staff should stay away from work if they or those they're living with display any symptoms of COVID-19 or their, their shielding. These and other criteria will need to be taken into account on a case-by-case -case basis to determine individual availability for work. We tend to use a phased approach, uh, phased approach, and this may need to be adopted depending on the balance between staff availability on the one hand and business demand. In some case, this might even necessitate changes in roles, responsibilities, and potentially a restructure either in an individual team or this might be company-wide. Uh, at all times, what we bore in mind was the, the need to communicate what we were doing and to consult with staff regarding any changes. It's very, very important. 
and um, we also bore in mind that we had to keep in consideration any additional training requirements that that might be might be needed so as we all know anyone displaying symptoms or living with someone who's symptomatic should stay away from work um, in all, just to do what we did in order to better understand who was actually able to return to work we used a risk assessment approach and we evaluated each individual team member taking into account factors such as uh, COVID-19 vulnerability so whether they were classed as a clinically extremely vulnerable person we looked at family circumstances whether um, there was any um, childcare issues as a result of school closures etc we looked at the criticality of their role to business continuity and several other relevant criteria. Um, so we, we formulated an assessment on an individual basis and on the basis of those results, we basically rated all of our team members on a RAG system to identify those who were available to work and where, whether that was in the office or whether that was, that was from home. So the green group were immediately available to work either from home or in the office. The amber group were able to work in the office, but they would need additional strict controls in place and the red group it wasn't going to be feasible for them to either work at home or return to the office. So obviously we then looked at bringing back members of the green group first. They were amongst the first, first cohort selected for return. Um, not all of those returned on the same day. They were progressively phased in. And this is still an ongoing gradual process based on the team and business requirements. In fact, we've just gone through a second phase of this where we've just done a sort of a, a reassessment of those that are still currently on furlough. So, so obviously this has taken quite a lot of people planning. Um, it's involved as considering on an ongoing basis, you know, are there going to be enough um, people in the organisation actually on the ground for us to, to carry out our work safely? Are the workloads for those people manageable? And we don't want them to, 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 to burn out because they're being, they're being um, overworked. We've had to weigh up the, um, the business need, the level of demand against the availability of personnel, as I've said taking into account individual circumstances and experiences and changes to our normal working practices. Uh, remember all times in this sort of process, it's important again, I'll emphasize to consult with employees and to communicate any changes. Communication is absolutely key. Um, you may need to consider temporary changes in contracts in order to do this, short time working. Obviously we have the furlough scheme. Um, in some cases, it may unfortunately be necessary to lay off or put people on unpaid leave or even make redundancies. But all of those things need to be taken into account in order to, to help the business move forwards. In terms of um, training, there are alternatives around to classroom based training. What we do is we, we identified what the training was safety critical, so what needed to be scheduled and what could be postponed or just pushed down the line a little bit. There's obviously a growing number of online courses, including those certified by IOSH and, and ourselves amongst others. Um, what we did bear in mind is that if there was any reduced training, then that needs to be compensated for by ensuring enhanced levels of supervision and monitoring in the workplace. Out of date certification, this is also an issue, although some uh, training centres are starting to open up again now, um, due to the closure of various training boards and training centres, staff may have been unable to undertake or refresh training. In many cases, extensions have been granted to certification. For example, the agency have said that companies are given permission to extend an employee's authorization to, to operate MHE, that's manual handling equipment, without any refresher training by up to three months due to the current exceptional circumstances. So please, if you need to check with either IOSH, SSG or other authorising bodies or the HSE for extensions, please do so. And I'm now going to hand over back to Adam, who's going to touch on a bit of mental health and wellbeing. Thanks, Jules. Um, yeah, I probably should have explained at the, at the beginning, we're going to be sort of piggybacking around these sections. So uh, thanks to Jules for that. And I was going to spend sort of just sort of 10 minutes or so talking to you about mental health and wellbeing. So um, I'm a mental health first aid instructor and teach a lot of a lot of mental health first aid and I've been involved with um, engaging with some of our team as a sort of mental health first aider throughout the crisis as well. And one of the models I wanted to sort of bring us to initially was if I can get my screen to advance, it's stuck, there we go, uh, is this, ray, this sort of model of a stress container. 
And when we're teaching this under normal circumstances, we talk about the fact that all of us as individuals have a sort of, you know, a, a container which we can sort of fill with the pressures of life. And under no, normal circumstances, we'd see the sort of um, three key areas on the screen filling my stress container. So we will be seeing my personal life applying pressures. We will see work life applying pressures and we will see things around my mental health and ongoing mental health conditions or other health conditions applying pressures. I think probably the majority of people listening who are sort of health and safety professionals will be well aware of the HSE's approach to considering those work-life pressures by using something like the HSE stress management standards and well aware of looking at uh, how they might apply and be managed. But recently there's been this big shift towards considering the sort of mental health conditions and the personal conditions um, as well because they have a huge impact on people's ability to attend or perform at work. What's really interesting at the moment is we've added in this new bubble of COVID-19 because I think what we're finding for the majority of people, we have stress containers already running a little bit full because of the anxieties and pressures surrounding the ongoing situation and virus. And I think what's been interesting, what I've noticed is as the sort of peak of the virus sort of eases and we come into this this sort of situation where we return to normal, we're now seeing some of those pressures really bubble to the surface and sort of fill people's stress containers. I think people have been running on adrenaline and sort of pushing forwards. And now we're seeing this changing sort of uh, situation where the adrenaline sort of dying down, we're returning to normal, but stress containers are still full of this sort of COVID fear, this fear of the unknown, this ever changing sort of situation. So I think what we start to see is that all of these other things pouring into our container now have a bigger impact. And exactly like Julie was saying earlier, we're now returning to work with reduced schemes, with firms still taking advantage of the furlough system, which means more workload for those who are back. It's creating a sort of a concoction of uh, sort of unique pressures and a sort of a pressure pot. So when we look at this model, what we don't want is our stress containers overflowing because that's when we see emotional snapping or that's when we see uh, people's stress signatures sort of exposed and we see people struggling. So what we really need to do is focus as individuals on learning how to manage our stress levels and empty our containers. And as employers, we need to be looking to how we can help employees manage their stress containers uh, or indeed um, provide ways for strat staff to sort of uh, uh, empty those. So the risks we're kind of looking at here are we're looking at sort of um, psychological and physical pressures and I think there's a little bit more of that um, at the moment and of course we're adding in that real risk of uh, fear of infection and the anxiety that goes along with that and some of those pressures as well when I was just talking about the pressures filling my stress container challenging dom domestic situations I was um in the situation where I found myself um, at home and furloughed, having to uh, suddenly learn how to be a school teacher for two young children. And it was um, an incredibly uh, unique time to be learning sort of a new range of skills and managing a multitude of new things, as well as dealing with the sort of uh, ongoing situation. And what we've also noticed by talking to my team, there's been a sort of odd um, kind of anxiety around people who are furloughed and people who are not furloughed. So we found team members who are furloughed have been very anxious about the fact that they are furloughed and they may be questioning why they're furloughed and they're not feeling as involved. And they might be wondering why other team members have been given the opportunity to sort of push forward and support the organisation where they haven't. And all of these thoughts are racing through people's heads. And then we turn to our non-furloughed workers who are feeling sort of, you know, pressures because they believe that all the furloughed workers are sat working on their furlough tans in the garden and not necessarily, you know, sort of uh, picking up some of the workload that they are. So whichever way you look at this, we find anxiety and stress on both sides. So sort of don't underestimate the viewpoints of each set of people in the, a variety of different situations, whatever they may be. One thing we talk about in mental health is the sort of, you know, remembering it's all about how I view my situation and how I feel about my situation. So don't assume that just because staff are sort of, you know, furloughed uh, and you feel secure and sort of safe about that, that they also do. 
In terms of signs and symptoms that we might notice, we might notice people experiencing physical um, physical sort of problems where we might see aches or pains or sort of headaches. We might see emotional problems where people's moods swing more, where we get people being snappy or angry. And we might see behavioural things where we maybe notice people being late or people having repetitive behaviours or people managing food or dealing with their situation by using more alcohol or sort of cigarettes. And if we're seeing any sort of changes really that's time when we sort of you know should be concerned and directly sort of uh, directly talk to people to see if there's anything that we need to know when we do identify that staff need support we might be looking at how as an organization we can support them uh, just a few really simple things on this sort of slide to sort of point out that if we have employee assistance programs now's the time to put those employee assistance programs into play. I consult uh, with, with companies and I find several companies who have an employee assistance program, but managers, directors, even sometimes, and staff are often unaware of what services they offer. So if we have an employee assistance program, make sure that we understand what they can do and make sure that those services are shared with staff so if staff need to get access to some of those services uh, they understand how maybe we're fortunate enough to have mental health first aiders in the organization and it might be important to think about how we um, put those into play later on we're going to be talking about physical first aid and ensuring we have enough physical first aiders available maybe we need to think about the same kind of questions with our mental health first aiders and check that we've got enough and that people have access to those um, and any occupational health advisors within our organization can help advise on all of this. But I just wanted to sort of add in the sort of point about the, the line managers roles here in making sure that their staff sort of, you know, feel managed, have access to all of this stuff and that they may well um, find themselves having some of these conversations with people and be taking on that role of a mental health first aider. So make sure that managers feel supported and are appropriately trained to feel with the conversations, deal with the conversations that they may be having. There are obviously a supporting in organizations outside of work we've got you know access in phone lines such as the samaritans or companies such as mind uh, and there's a range of sources on the uh, nhs website that we can direct staff members to should they uh, require additional uh, support so i just mentioned there sort of line managers and mental health first aiders um, and people might be sort of now sort of sat watching thinking now is the time to sort of uh, make sure we get some robust training into place to support people uh, with this more now than probably ever before. Uh, we just sort of wanted to uh, make an awareness of sort of, you know, the, the fact that there is plenty of training out there. And if we're looking at the IOSH courses, such as the Occupational Health and Wellbeing course or their Mental Health Awareness course, um, there's availability there. And we're also seeing a lot of the organisations moving their training online. So most of the training we're sort of seeing are uh, half day sort of awareness type courses, one day support courses aimed at line management and sort of mental health and then the sort of full mental health first aider courses which, which sort of offer that support but some of those courses are now available online so if you do have furloughed staff and you do want to be getting some training in whilst that's a possibility uh, it might be well worth looking at sort of uh, utilising those um, online courses. And those courses will teach us how to spot signs and symptoms, provide help, support someone who's experiencing those mental health um, um, issues. Uh, and as a business, how we might establish a mental health first, action, um, first aid action plan or how we might risk assess our occupational health as a whole. I think the key thing in mental health, one thing that we sort of um, focus on a lot is just talking about mental health is probably the biggest enemy of poor mental health so just having a chat just asking your staff how they are and just listening to people letting people express their emotion without judgment without kind of a opinion on why is really really powerful so i also volunteer for a men's mental health charity called um, andy's man club and we effectively merely facilitate conversations it's just a forum where people can come along and talk and time and time again i'm reminded of just how powerful talk is just asking your employees are you okay or asking a colleague are you okay or asking a friend are you okay and allowing them the opportunity to reply honestly and openly is incredibly powerful now saying that maybe we've got staff who are self-isolating maybe we've got staff who are working from home maybe we've got staff um, 
who um, aren't sort of uh, as uh, in contact with us as much as we would like. And it's really important to think about how we connect and how we contact with them. So consider things like calls and video calls and regular check-ins. And even if people are saying they're okay, making sure that we follow that up and making sure that people do feel supported and have the opportunity to express their feelings. And sort of from all of our mental health training, really here, I've just sort of put the line, focus on feeling and facts, not fear. We're in a sort of situation where media and social media are bombarding us with information. And let's just try and get back to how people are feeling and why people are sort of feeling anxious. I've spoken to many people who have anxieties around the sort of um, the, the ongoing situation and the sort of viral risk that maybe I don't agree with, but that's my opinion and not theirs. So allow them to express their anxieties and understand that they're real for them. And one other thing I just wanted to talk about, I think we'll sort of, um, we might touch on this again later, but it's sort of boosting morale amongst those. And one thing that we sort of, um, we did, I'll talk about in just a second, but think about sort of, you know, how we might boost morale amongst our teams, how we manage our own mental well-being, and how we manage the well-being of our teams. And one thing we did as a company was we just early on, one of our staff members, um, uh, sort of Miles Redhead, came up with this idea of utilising a work WhatsApp group. And he made sure that we got all of our staff into it. And he just did a sort of Friday fun uh, kind of exercise. And the, the one shown on the screen was from our wear a hat Friday competition where we all had to wear um, an appropriate uh, hat um, and share our photo within the WhatsApp group. And it just allowed a sort of sense of sort of um, a sort of belonging for all of our team really and got everyone involved. And we sort of had some good laughs with, with that along the way. So simple things like that can go a really, really long way to making people feel engaged uh, and feeling a part of the team. So think about things like how we communicate as a company and make it clear and simple make sure that people feel involved and make, make sure that people feel included and make sure that we engage people in how we think um, make sure we engage people making sure that, that, that their opinions are listened to we understand how they think and they fit that they feel and think about what we can do to sort of uh, support that moving forwards and we're just sort of finishing off there by sort of stating make sure that um, we, we keep promises and we do what we say we will do and also on this screen we've sort of seen this very rapidly emerging world of online communication and we've seen things like microsoft teams evolve massively over the last sort of six to eight weeks um, and the sort of zoom platform becomes sort of much more sort of uh, understood and used by many so make sure that we sort of utilize those tools available to us to uh, to stay in touch uh, right at this point i'm going to hand back to um julie who's going to talk us through safe systems of work uh, and then uh, I think it will come back to me a little bit later. So over to you again, Jules. Thanks very much, Adam. Right, so as everybody knows, uh, it is a legal requirement to, to carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment now um, as we get back to work. Um, and if you've got more than 50 employees in the company, then you will need to display a compliance notice, although I would suggest that this is good practice anyway and an access reassurance to both your, your employees and to, to anyone that visits the premises. The, the aim of the COVID-19 risk assessment is obviously to, to specifically address hazards related to COVID-19, but also to ensure that you reduce the transmission of the, the virus to, to as low as reasonably practicable to alarm. You might need to consider not just uh, staff that are coming back onto the premises, but also um, delivery drivers, uh, any staff that are working on other premises, home workers, if you've got areas um, where you have production lines, or if you have warehouses or workshops, these also need to be taken into consideration. In terms of workplace inspections, you're gonna to need to make sure that the, the risk assessments are actually being adhered to and followed, um, including your social distancing and hygiene measures. Um, so it's important that you do conduct these inspections on a regular basis to, to make sure that you have ongoing compliance. Um, and please don't forget that um, as we learn more and government guidance changes as, as it frequently does at the moment, um, risk assessments are going to need to be reviewed, updated and then re-communicated to, to, to the workforce so that they, they understand what those, what those changes are. So, so looking at it from a hazard um, perspective is, is, is one approach. But the other thing we can do is also look at task-based risk assessments. 
Um, we employ a similar sort of RAG scheme, red, amber, green, as, as we did to looking at um, individual risk assessments. But instead of addressing specific, the specific hazard of COVID-19, you can also look at the particular tasks that have been undertaken um, by, by your staff and assign each of these a traffic light category. So it might be that if you assign a task a red category, it means that it cannot be done um, using current methods in, 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 the, current, in the current environment. An, an amber um, task might mean that you have to make a few changes to the process um, in order for it to go ahead. And obviously a green lighted task could then be undertaken without any significant changes. So if you use this combined approach used from, from both the hazard and the task perspective of risk assessment, you can uh, make more robust uh, business decisions as to whether you can work safely going forwards uh, or not. Uh, so a key part of the risk assessment process is obviously to set aside, uh, set out arrangements for social distancing, um, such as planning, scheduling, organising work in order to, to minimise contact and to, to avoid crowding in the workplace. You might consider separation of high and low risk teams. So if you have a team that is sort of out and about in, in the public um, sphere, you might want to consider trying to keep that as separate as you can from a team that is just based in a, in a fairly low risk office environment. You need to think about whether the, the activity is critical, should it go ahead? Again, you can look at this if on, on a task-based risk assessment basis. You should also consider minimising the number of staff and reducing interface time associated with each activity and try to keep the same staff on the same shift and within the same teams, again, to limit interaction be between these. If you do have staff that are needed, need to work sort of in more closer proximity to, to one another, then obviously side by side working or facing away from each other is much more preferable than face to face. Although you can, if needed, obviously install protective shields in order to, to, to help with this. One of the things we do when we're looking at any, um, any uh, risk con control mechanism is to, to look at a sort of a hierarchy of control. Um, and there's an example here um, for you on the, on the screen. So obviously if we start with eliminating the hazard. Um, we can't eliminate COVID-19 <laughs> as much as we might like to, um, but we can ask that staff who are unwell don't come into work. So don't bring the virus into, into the work environment. We can try to reduce the hazard, as I said before, by minimizing the number of staff involved in close working, uh, minimizing interface time between staff, so the frequency and duration of, of time that they're actually um, working together. Um, and keeping any close work to short duration, as short a duration as, as possible. We can try and isolate groups of staff who have to work together by keeping them in teams and not interchanging workers between those teams. And then we can put in place administrative controls such as safe systems of work, which we've already just talked about, and additional supervision and monitoring to, to ensure compliance. PPE and RPE is the least effective of the control measures. I know a lot of it, a lot has been said about it recently, um, and we'll just talk about that in a little bit more detail now. So it has been a bit of a contentious issue. If your existing risk assessments, so we're not talking just about the COVID-19 risk assessments, but your other existing risk assessments specify that PPE, RPE is required, then it should be worn. Um, but we do realise that there has been increased demand for PPE and RPE, and this has led um, to some shortages. But if PPE or RPE is required as a safe system of work and none's available, then the work activity should, should not proceed, because as I said, that is your last defence against exposure to a potential hazard, and, and it's critical that that is, is then used. Um, I don't know whether you want to say anything more on that, that Adam, at all. Sorry, just struggling to unmute my microphone. Um, I, I think I agree with that. I think that what we've seen a lot is there's been a lot of focus and a lot of fuss on PPE and RPE, quite rightly so, but we must remember it is the last resort. And I think the other thing for me that I really focus on when I'm teaching health and safety is I focus on the fact that PPE used badly can provide a bizarre situation where we increase risk and I've seen this myself in a supermarket where I've seen someone wearing gloves around the supermarket because it's protecting them from the virus they've walked out of the supermarket getting into their car and driven off still wearing the gloves with no washing or 
gelling of the glove surface. So what they've effectively done, if they have touched viral contamination, if they've spread it to all of those environments. So one of the things that I find is quite critical is that when we're wearing personal protective equipment, we also sometimes bring with that a sense of security that may be unwarranted in some situations. So it's really, really important that PPE is worn as a last resort, but all the other measures that we've talked about, such as social distancing and good hand washing, are definitely still observed. So yeah, I'm sorry, just backing you up on that one. I think it's a really important point to make. No, thank you. That's that's great. So obviously, if you do wear reusable PPE or RPE, uh, make sure that you thoroughly clean it after use and don't share it with others. If it's single use disposable PPE or RPE, then obviously uh, dispose of that safely after use. Um, there is guidance on the HC website for face fit testing of, of RPE, um, especially during um, the, these times. So, so please have a look at that um, and access that advice. Um, RPE shouldn't be confused with, with face coverings. RPE prevents exposure to um, a hazardous substance such as, such as dust or fumes. The, the coverings are basically to protect others from, from your own <laughs> fumes, if you, if, if you like. Um, government advice currently advises wearing face coverings, obviously in hospitals, GP surgeries and, and on public transport. So if we just Think about emergency arrangements, often uh, forgot, but an essential part of a, a safe system of work. Uh, we must try and think about how the uh, COVID-19 situation is, is impacting on our, on our emergency arrangements that we have in place. So we need to make sure that we do have a procedure for staff who fall ill due to COVID-19 to, to avoid the risk of transmission. One of the things we also need to do is conduct an assessment of our first aid and fire warden cover. Um, because of the, the availability of staff, you might not have the required number of first aiders or fire wardens, um, you know, actually on the premises for the number of people that you, you, you've brought back at the, at the current time. So one of the ways you can think about mitigating this is potentially, if you share premises, is to share emergency cover with, with other companies working on the same premises so that you, you basically sort of have a, a cohort of uh, first aiders and fire wardens that cover the you know, the, the entire building rather than just the part that, that you, you occupy. The other thing you could potentially think of doing is stopping or reducing any high risk activities, obviously reduce the risk of, of any further accident or, or serious injury. And bear in mind that um, current guidance from Resuscitation Council is that if CPR is required, then it's mouth to mouth resuscitation is not recommended, it's chest compressions only. So no mouth to mouth compression, uh, no mouth to mouth resuscitation at this time, just <laughs> compressions, <laughs> pop that out eventually. Um, there are new COVID-19 riddle reporting um, requirements, which I will go on to talk about on the next slide. Um, after I've just gone through a sort of a basic procedure for, um, for uh, looking at uh, somebody who might display symptoms at work. So, so if you do have somebody at work who displays mild symptoms, then obviously the key thing is to send them home as soon as possible, avoiding social distancing, ask them to avoid public transport if possible, and make sure you clean down their work area, tools and equipment with appropriate sanitizer and disinfectant. If somebody's showing more um, severe symptoms and is unable to get themselves home, then um, you might want to provide them with a disposable um, face mask and gloves. If you have uh, facilities available, you might want to quarantine them in a, in a particular room or, or at least isolate them um, and contact either an, a relative who can come pick them up or, uh, if necessary, emergency services. So just to give you a quick rundown as to what's changed with, with Riddle reporting, uh, so if you if there's an unintended incident that happens at work and this does lead to someone's possible or actual exposure to, uh, exposure to coronavirus, this is now considered a dangerous occurrence and needs to be reported as such. If a worker is actually diagnosed, so has a medical diagnosis as having COVID-19 and there is reasonable evidence that, that it was caused by a workplace exposure, then that needs to be reported as a case of disease. Uh, and if a worker ultimately dies as a result of occupational exposure to, to, to coronavirus, then obviously that needs to be reported as a fatality, but due to exposure to a biological agent um, using the, the case of disease report. So just bear in mind that if you do have um, any COVID-19 related um, incidents at work, then you may very well be required to, to report those. Just a little bit on basic um, injury first aid. So there is a currently a three month extension to emergency first aid and first aid at work training in place. 
So if needed, uh, certification can be extended by this, period, by this period of time. You might need to think about training your first aiders with, um, with the knowledge they need to protect themselves. So what have you done? What, what are the changes in the procedures that you've adopted um, in order to take into account uh, necessary COVID-19 measures? They might not necessarily know about them, so you need to make sure that they're, they're adequately, adequately trained in, in that. Uh, we also need to know how we're going to protect our first aiders. Treating a casualty is obviously always going to be a key priority, um, but we need to think about any other additional equipment that might be needed in first aid kits. You might need to uh, uh, sorry, uh, you might need to um, to provide face shields, eye protection, aprons, disposable gloves, etc. Always bear in mind that if, in the event of any injury, then the, the first um, first and foremost. Um, principle is to preserve life. It's a, if it's only a minor injury, then it may very well be that the first aider doesn't actually even make, need to make contact with, with, the, uh, with the casualty. They might just be able to instruct them as to how to, you know, put a plaster on or bind up a, a, a wound themselves. If it is something where, which requires more hands-on first aid, then obviously wear disposable gloves, wear a face shield and an apron, potentially a face mask as well, um, and remove and dispose of all of this after, after use. And finally, just, just bear in mind that, you know, because of the additional burden on the NHS service, it might take longer for emergency services to, to, to reach you or for you to be seen in A&E. So that's, that's something just to just bear in mind. For fire and evacuation, obviously your workplace documentation updates might include um, any required changes to fire evacuation procedures. So you might have different routes out of the building now. You might have different muster points. You might have several muster points instead of one and you need to know how that's all going to, to work and obviously you need to communicate all those differences to, to everybody that's, that's at work at the time. It may be that you decide temporarily to just delay any planned evacuations um, to actually reduce the, uh, the risk of, of contact between people in, in the short term. Um, so make sure you've got a documented plan in place of how you're going to conduct a fire evacuation and make sure that everybody knows what that is. Okay, Adam, I believe you're going to do a little bit on uh, safe travel now. Yeah, I'll do a little bit on safe travel and um, then a little bit on safe workplace, but I'm, I'm aware that sort of time is slipping away, so I'm going to be uh, relatively swift. But just in terms of travel, obviously, current government guidelines is to avoid using public transport wherever possible. And um, especially during peak times, and if we do have staff travelling on public transport, ensuring that they're wearing face coverings. So we should try wherever possible to encourage alternative means of getting to work, such as walking or cycling. And obviously that meets all of our sort of green objectives, as well as keeping people safe during um, COVID. And uh, if we do have staff travelling, they should travel alone where possible. We should avoid sharing vehicles unless it's absolutely um, uh, a sort of something that, that sort of has to be done, because obviously then we're providing more sort of uh, risk of cross infection. If uh, we do have to share vehicles, make sure that we again use this sort of um, isolation approach or sort of like schools are calling the bubbles where we have sort of staff bubbles. So if we do get infection um, identified, it's sort of limited to a small group. Make sure that whilst we're in vans we main or, or cars, we maintain good ventilation, uh, using good hygiene in terms of hand sanitization and good vehicle cleaning making sure that touch points in particular are cleaned which brings me on to talking about safe workplace and again some of those points are going to apply because one of the things we really need to think about are safe workplaces the first thing if we sort of you know just going back to health and safety work act access and egress isn't it getting people in and out and we're going to have entry and exit points uh, that are going to be seeing the, the sort of probably the biggest footfall and one of the most um, significant sort of uh, touch point sharing situations where we've got door handles and uh, a, a sort of doorbells that are sort of being shared. So we need to be risk assessing, um, like we were talking about earlier, and making sure that the number and location of these are considered, that we're thinking about pedestrians and vehicles, and we're thinking about how we get people in. Are we going to be limiting the number of people in? Are we going to be using social distance queuing? And like Jules said, not forgetting those emergency situations. It's good practice to have hand sanitization at all entrances and exits so that we can sort of sanitize hands on the way out um, and on the way in. And sort of obviously it's therefore really important to have clear signs demarcating what people should do, make it quite obvious and quite straightforward to get in and out of your building sort of by following the, the sort of uh, relevant procedures. And clearly these areas are going to have high level of footfall potentially and going to need additional cleaning throughout. 
as well as our own staff, we might have to think about visitors to our premises and maybe we should be cutting down on non-essential visitors. We've talked a lot already about using sort of Zoom or, or sort of virtual meetings. Do people have to come to site? Is there another way for us to see them? And if we have contractors joining us, we need to, as always, make sure that contractors not only provide us with their own COVID control measures, but also make sure that they fully understand what our COVID control measures are and make sure that they understand how to comply with our rules and we need to make sure that we manage contractors in that way as well and they are complying with the requirements that we want to see. Delivery drivers are a little bit more difficult because we maybe don't have as much control but again it might be about making it clear to them as to where they need to go with their deliveries where they need to be leaving things and how they need to be interacting uh, with us and extending that to loading and offloading um, of general goods and equipment as well it's just about making sure that when we're risk assessing we would consider all parties uh, and everyone at play and not just our staff so within the workplace, we need to think about, again, about sort of particularly shared areas where there's sort of, you know, sort of risks of, of sort of uh, the virus spread, where you've got increased vectors for virus spread. And we need to be thinking about things like canteens and toilets um, and how we do this. Uh, maybe thinking about staggered start times. So one thing we've done is staggered our start times for our courses. So that helps with our entry and exit sort of um sort of focal points but it also means that we're then staggering breaks we're staggering lunches which staggers the impact on our sort of toilets and facilities we jules has already talked about isolating our teams into high risk and low risk and we should be sort of seriously sort of considering the impact that a covid positive um diagnosis might have on that team if we're having to then isolate a team how we sort of get around that and by keeping groups mixing into sort of zones into teams might aid uh, with that sort of situation and then again thinking about things like lifts or doorbells or touch points or handrails and making sure that they are regularly cleaned and disinfected and we're seeing this a lot where we have pedestrian routes where I've seen several supermarkets do it where we're implementing one way systems to try and encourage social distancing and stop sort of people passing or interacting um, in exactly the same way that we might do for management. So make sure we review our traffic management plans. Another thing we've done at SSG is we've assessed the capacity of each of our rooms on each of our doors, particularly for our training rooms. We have the maximum number of people that can comfortably sit in, fit into that room whilst observing two metre social distancing. So we've sort of gone for the two metre sort of social distancing um, sort of setup, and that's clearly designated uh, on our doors. And then for toilets, again, equally identifying how many people we can comfortably have in. So what we found for some is that it's a one in one out sort of system with a simple sort of in out sign on the door or for others you can have a couple of people but we need to limit facilities within there's no real right or wrong to this it's a risk assessed based approach but finding practical pragmatic solutions to sort of allow clear understanding of what what rules should be fire, sort of followed in those situations so i've talked about toilet facilities and making sure we restrict capacity uh, and sign with hand sanitizers uh, for entry and exit and an increased uh cleaning regime and again, hand washing. We've seen again, it's, it's it almost impossible to stress how important hand washing is in sort of viral spread because soaps rapidly break down the sort of external surfaces of the uh, of the virus. And so hand washing really is key. So we need to make sure that wherever possible, we have pro appropriate, simple, ready access to hand washing stations. And then where that's not possible, hand sanitizers uh, of an appropriate sort of caliber. So we're looking at 60% or higher alcohol content. From a cleaning point of view, we might want to consider um, deep cleaning before reopening and we might want to consider regular ongoing cleaning. Um, we make sure we have regular touch point cleaning of handrails and door handles, etc. And make sure that those cleaning um, uh, regimes are sort of uh, robust and well implemented. And again, it's going back to the fundamental basics, reminding staff of the importance of hand washing, the importance of using a tissue to catch a cough or a sneeze, making sure that tissues are disposed of in an appropriate uh, way um, so that they don't spread infection. If staff are caught off guard with a cough or a sneeze, using our elbow to make sure that we're not contaminating hands that are gonna contaminate other surfaces. And then making it very clear 
that if a staff is staff members are unwell we follow those procedures that, that uh, Jules was talking about and we make sure we isolate and if we have the symptoms in line with the um the sort of covid uh, sort of virus that we make sure that we go onto the nhs website uh, and follow the appropriate uh, action uh, in that situation and i will reiterate again although i'm pretty sure that everyone watching at this point when i tell you to avoid touching your face will find yourself touching your face especially if i do it it's in, it's an incredibly difficult habit to get out of but avoiding touching your face is very important. Now, I just wanna contradict something I said earlier when I was talking about gloves and the risk of cross-contamination. Previous um, experience, I started my career as a chemist and I found when I was working in labs, one thing that gloves did was actually create a psychological barrier that helped you not touch your face. Because if you're in a lab and you're working with aggressive chemicals, you don't want to be getting those onto your face or near your eyes and wearing gloves did help with that avoiding face touching. So there is a bit of a contradiction there. So it's about risk assessing, again, the situations and working out what works best for you. But that face contact is incredibly difficult to cut down on, but it's something we need to work on. So I think the final, the final slide and the final section, I'm gonna hand you back to uh, Jules and just a really quick talk around safe plant and machinery. And then I'm pretty sure we can go back to James and open it up for questions. So Jules. Thank you. Yeah, this is just going to be really, really brief. All I wanted to do basically was just draw uh, draw attention to uh, something that's been posted on the HC website. So they've actually stated that there, there's a there's a higher risk of, of lifting equipment failure if it's not examined as per the, the six monthly uh, LOLA schedules. Um, and duty holders still continue to, they're, they're still expected to take all reasonably practical steps to, to make sure that their equipment uh, complies with the law. Um, but the HC are going to keep the situation under review. Um, they don't have any plans to, to issue any exemptions to LOLA requirements. So you, your work equipment is still required to, to remain safe for use um, if it's in use and documented inspections will still be required where stated in a risk assessment that that, that, that is the case. In terms of thorough inspection and testing, the HC have said that, um, that if the only issue with the equipment is that the test certificate is out of date, it's, it's unlikely that any action will be taken, but only if that equipment is, being, is absolutely critical and is being used for essential work and can otherwise be operated safely. Um, so obviously um, refer to the CPA and HC websites for, for further information on this. Um, with respect to the uh, to general plant and machinery, Obviously, it's a good idea to try and limit the amount of operators. So one operator per machine or per, per MUBE. Um, if you're doing any maintenance on, on plant equipment or machinery, then try and avoid sharing tools and make sure those are cleaned down after use. And again, avoid any unnecessary high risk work um, reschedule if, if that's possible. And I think the rest of the slide just reiterates what I, what I, what I said previously. So, so that's all I really have to say on, uh, on plant machinery and equipment. But obviously, if anyone's got any questions later, then I can, I can answer those. Hang on, stuck. There you go. Uh, so um, thanks, George. I think I basically just wanted to sort of uh, close close that out. And um, hopefully, uh, I saw in the chat someone was saying that it's sort of being useful to them. So that was uh, that was reassuring to know that at least one person has been helped. But we tried to sort of give that sort of uh, an overview of all this information that's swimming around at the moment. Sort of pull it all into one place um and sort of get us thinking about some practical um implementation of, of some of this and we focused on those key areas of safe people thinking about um our staff set up and structure and what that may look like including sort of training and consideration for that and then i sort of did a big focus on that mental health sort of section because for me that's a really really sort of important topic and really really important to get get right. Uh, we then talked about safe systems of work and risk assessments and what that might look like, but reminding everyone not to forget about those emergency situations. All too often we find ourselves in a situation where that sort of gets a bit left and when an emergency does happen, we're reacting in a sort of panic situation with, si with sort of procedures that don't necessarily fit and haven't been well practiced. Um, and then we had a look at sort of uh, uh, travel to work and following the sort of government guidelines and taking this as an opportunity maybe to review some green initiatives for travel as well. And we then looked at sort of workplace settings and we looked at workplace cleaning and social distancing and how we might manage um, some of those uh, sort of situations. Um, and then sort of bringing that into our workplace plant and equipment and things like sort of pure and lower sort of compliance testing as well. Um, so that pretty much, uh, 
sums up everything I think we wanted to say. So thanks everyone for listening. We'll open it up to questions now. So if we have any questions, that would be appreciated. Um, I think that's probably it from me. So I think I'll probably stop the screen share now. Um, and I think that a set of the slides will be available to everyone. I think uh, that's, um, that's, that's going to happen and we'll take any questions. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Adam. Uh, Julie, Adam, thanks very much for the presentation. It was brilliant. Uh, for those of you who are uh, listening, you now have an opportunity to ask questions if you haven't already. Um, um, so first question uh, from Simon is with reference to riddle reporting. And he just wants to know if, if this is specific to clinical settings, um, as it may be difficult to pin down the causes um, of COVID um, otherwise. Um, so Adam, Julie, any, anything on that? Well, my understanding is that it's, it applies generally. So um, it's not just specifically for, for clinical settings. Um, I appreciate it. It might be difficult to, to pin down the, the exact uh, the exact point of, of, or of origin of a, of a new outbreak. Um, I guess the government track and trace system is going to be employed for that purpose uh, when it eventually comes to, to fruition. Um, but that's, that's all I can really comment on at the moment. Um, okay. The second point that's come up I've just seen is any advice on frequency of cleaning of common, common touch points. Well, what we do here is uh, at SG, we, we obviously have, um, uh, we have our, our general cleaners that come in at the end of each day and do, do a thorough clean down. But during the day, we clean all our common uh, areas and touch points four times a day. Um, so once all of our delegates have entered the centre and are safely in the, the training rooms, we, we clean down all the communal areas and the common touch points and the welfare facilities. Um, once they've finished first break, we do the same after lunch, after second break, and then the cleaners um, do the, the cleaning in the, uh, after, after the end of the causes. Uh, we use uh, our own product that we generate in-house. Um, it's a sanitizer and disinfectant. Um, you need, it's, it's got a very um, short shelf life, so it only lasts for three to five days. So you can't get this on in supermarkets. You just have to um, buy a unit that basically makes it on premises, but it's very effective. It's completely um, safe to use, um, non-hazardous, and it's, it's great. We all basically have our own personal containers that we use to sanitize our own workstations as well. Um, so, so that's basically how we go about making sure that we've got a, a nice, clean, sanitized, disinfected workplace for, for all of our staff and all of our delegates as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, that, that you may have seen um, uh, David Jenkins asking uh, are you advocating that face-to-face -face training uh, uh, could now take place? Over to you Adam for this one. <laughs> well, I, I think that's very much what, what we're doing, we're practicing good social distancing, we're making sure that our course numbers are below the room capacities and like, Ju like Julie said that we're making sure that we implement good robust cl cleaning regimes. We've had some slightly more difficult situations because we've been finding whilst we put a lot of our training online and like many firms we've reacted very rapidly to online training and that works well in a, in a variety of situations we've got an interesting situation whereas if you'd asked me six months ago about online training I would have said it's not it's not the same. I don't get the same um, a sort of um, emotional kind of uh, intelligence response as a tutor to be able to read my delegates. I'm just getting a person's face on screen. It's hard to read them. However, now I would say that actually online training brings some sort of benefits and for some courses is very good. But clearly we've got situations where whilst we're able to offer that kind of service, things like first aid, in, in my opinion, I know companies do offer online training, practical hands-on first aid is absolutely essential. And so when we look at some of the even more difficult situations, even the first aid councils are advocating face-to-face um, -face training where proper social conditioning, uh, social distancing rules are applied and where appropriate hygiene is implemented. So uh, we are very much delivering sort of face-to-face -face training, albeit on a slow sort of phased return to um, some kind of normal. So uh, uh, I think yes. Great, Adam, thanks. Uh, another a few questions popping up here. If we have time to answer more, uh, we will. Uh, one from Martin Jones. Uh, do COVID safe, safe systems of work documents need to be displayed in work vehicles like windows? Um, I, I would imagine it would just depend how extensive the documentation was. You'd probably be obscuring the vision somewhat if you, uh, if you posted it all over. Um, I think as long as they're actually um, within the works vehicles, I, I don't think there's necessarily any, any need to, to display it. 
in the windows or, or windscreens. Okay. It might be more of a hazard to do so. So keep a copy to hand, but. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, one more from Adala. Do you have any advice on the use of hand dryers and paper towels? Um, the Gov website says you can use either, uh, but then a link to the NSS website saying that shows you how to wash your hands and refers to using paper towels rather than using hand dryers. So that's a good, interesting question. I think that one of the one of the links I'll make there from a medical setting. So I'm a previous St. John Ambulance sort of volunteer and have therefore experienced um, uh, a whole day course on hand washing, which is a, an, ex an exciting prospect uh, and just shows how complicated it can be. One of the advances there of using paper towels is you can also use the paper towel for turning off taps and opening doors to stop contact with touch points so that's one of the reasons paper towels are preferred in a um, healthcare context is if you watch a nurse who's been trained to wash her hands they will always dry their hands with paper towels and then use the paper towel for turning off taps or opening doors to reduce that so I think that's where that advice comes from however if you look at the use of some of the modern hand dryers uh, they all use antimicrobial sort of plastics and sort of modern sort of uh, ways of ensuring they're effective drying hands and like you said I think the H, uh, the government website is sort of a bit vague again I think it comes down to risk assessment and then of course we have that conflict again between environmental initiatives and maybe getting rid of paper towels versus using paper towels so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that I'm afraid I think it's in line with risk assessment the risk of your setting and what works for you but in my opinion if we're doing good hand washing and then applying alcohol gel post hand washing as sort of belt and braces um, I'm sure it's fine either way Okay, great. Adam, thank you. Uh, there are a, a, a series of questions coming through at the moment, but I'm afraid we're into our last uh, two minutes of these webinars. Uh, so for those of you that have posted a question and it hasn't been answered, uh, we will email you directly and, and post both the questions and the answers um, online. So um, I, I, I need to end the, the session now by thanking both Adam and Julie and for all those who have joined us for this webinar today. Uh, we'll be sending out the link to this presentation along with the slides to the email addresses that you have registered with. So please uh, look out for that email and we'll also answer those questions uh, that unfortunately have gone um, unanswered. So um, unless there's anything else from Adam and Julie, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for attending the webinar. And we yeah, shall I'd see just like to just add one, one little thing. I mean, obviously, there's, there's some fantastic resources available on the, the Irish website, so I'd very much encourage everybody to, to, to visit that. Um, we've also got a whole pile of free resources that we're very happy to provide to, to people that would back up a lot of the, the information we've provided you with. So, you know, visit the Irish website, visit the SSG website. There's, there's plenty of information out there, but we've worked really hard to try and collate everything together so that you've got a sort of a you know, a, a, a good a good start if you're if you're thinking of opening up or if you just want to check what you are currently doing to open up against sort of some 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 good advice. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for attending, everybody. And from here, we'll say goodbye. <laughs>